Hello everyone, this is Caleb Simpson, and you are watching my walkthrough for Chrono Trigger for Nintendo DS. This video covers the Lost Sanctum, which is an optional side area that you can accomplish in the DS version as well as the Steam and mobile versions as well. This is unlocked just after completing the Blackbird, and there's a cinematic that shows these portals appearing in 65 million BC and 600 AD. Now if you go to 600 AD and then go to the top right continent, then there is the portal here, so you just want to land the epic near it, and then go inside this portal. This will take you to an underground area, and as soon as you enter, you will then see that it is overrun with monsters. So we can't do anything here. So instead, you want to return back to 65 million BC and try again. All right, so as far as rewards for this, there's three that I think are kind of notable. There's the Dragon Arm for Robo, which is just like a regular damage. It's just a little bit nicer than the Terraton Arm, and it's a good alternative if you don't want to use the Crisis Arm, because that's funky. Um, another really good one is the Valor Crest for Ayla. It's one of the craziest accessories in the entire game. Super, super overpowered. What it does is the higher level Ayla is, the stronger it gets, and basically it can mean that her regular attack becomes really, really nuts, and she can just destroy bosses like crazy. Super, super super good. Very, very synergistic with her. Very wonderful. Now, lastly, there's the Champion's Bag for Frog, which will give him the same bonus as the Hero's Badge and also reduces his MP usage. Just best in slot for him. Just a really, really good item that increases his regular attack damage as well as his... Um, as well as his spells, but it just makes it a little bit nicer. And then lastly, the last bonus you get for completing this is the fact that you will get a shop that sells elixirs and mega elixirs, which is the most rare consumables in the entire game. In the regular game, it's actually just a finite number of those, but meanwhile in the Lost Sanctum, if you can complete it, you'll gain access to that shop and you can buy as many of them as you want. So it's really nice. That's a super valuable thing. So those would be the reasons for why you would want to do the Lost Sanctum. So for the first step of this quest, you can optionally go to 600 AD, it doesn't really matter, but if you enter in 65 million BC instead, what you'll find is that it looks like it's a town, but it's completely abandoned and there is no monsters this early on in the time period. So if you then go to the top right corner, because our characters say we should explore, you'll find yourself in Millennia Forest. Now here, this area is filled with monsters and we need to destroy them all and then return to town and we can meet up with our quest givers. Now just a quick comment for those of you who've been following along with me is that Luca, I've been relying on her like tabin uh, clothing, whatever, to give her plus to speed so that she could keep up with everybody else. But now that I am like towards the end of the game, I'm going to go ahead and start wearing a prismatic dress and that slot, which is really, really good for her. It'll actually give her some physical defense so she doesn't die when she's fighting physical people. Uh, but so what I'm going to do is, because I'm not getting the speed from those tabin um, outfits, I'm going to go ahead and throw some of my speed capsule slash tabs on her. So what the Lost Sanctum is, is a series of quests. If you look on the right side of the screen right now, I have the current qu quest listed on screen, and it shows what the various uh, objectives are, so you can see the various steps. So meanwhile, I have like what time period we're currently in, and because we're going to keep going back and forth between 65 million BC and 600 B BC, and I say where to go, as well as what the, the quest objectives or objects are going to be in purple text, and meanwhile the rewards or things you find in chests are going to be in teal text. And so that's what I'm going to be doing back and forth, so you can just glance at the screen and see what you need, and you can skip in the video to get to the appropriate quest that you're currently on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just talk about the enemy encounters and explain like all the new enemies we're fight facing and the strategies for how to defeat them, and I'll show like the area in general the first time we run through it, but after that, I'm for all the consecutive runs through that zone, I'm not going to talk about it at all. I'm just going to fast forward or just skip straight to the end, and I'm not even going to show all the gameplay of me fighting all the enemies because it's all the same stuff over and over again, so you don't need to see all that. So yes, you're going to have to fight through all the enemies or sneak past them, whatever you want to do. Part of the whole point, like again, part of the whole point of The Lost Sanctum is just to give you an excuse. Like you're killing enemies anyways to try and level up, and so you might as well be getting, like working towards quest rewards is the reasoning for it. Now that all being said, this first area in Millennia Forest, there's a bunch of enemies here, and basically the kind of theme of all these ones, not all of them do counterattacks, but just about all of them do. So what you want to do is just hit them as hard as you possibly can so you can defeat them before they have a counter and so you don't have to worry about it. Now my recommendation for that is just to go ahead and use enemy or use characters that have a bunch of full screen clear. And these enemies don't have any particular weaknesses. Some of them are a little bit more susceptible to physical damage. Some are a little bit more susceptible to magic, but not by much. They're all pretty similar, so don't even worry about it. Just hit them with whatever you want. The Ogun Chieftains, they have the, um, like, maces, so you might be thinking to yourself that you can burn them like you could with the, uh, the guys earlier in the game. That does not work with these guys. They're, you, they don't have any extra defenses or anything. They just have a counterattack. So, just defeat them with whatever. What I'd recommend you do is just use some really hard-hitting full screen clear. Ideally, something that costs a lot of magic, and you can go ahead and put on like some gold studs on whoever is using the highest cost spell. So for example, I have a gold stud on Luca right now so that she can use Flare. Now Flare default only costs 20, so it's very expensive, but because she has that item on, she can use it all the time and it doesn't cost very much. 
So one of the things that I'm trying to do is level up Magus because he still needs a lot of TP, and a lot of the enemies in this whole Lost Sanctum zone, or whatever, this whole side quest, is they are immune, some of them are immune to light, some of them are immune to shadow, there's only like, like one enemy that's actually immune to magic in general, but generally speaking, you can just use full screen magic attacks for everything, and one of the best elements to use for that against most of the enemies is either fire or shadow. There's only a couple encounters where they're immune to shadow or absorb shadow, but they're very obvious, like, you know, they're undead enemies, you know, like, of course you're not going to use shadow for that, so you just switch to fire. So anyways, Magus is a really good character for this area. I think this is the area in the game where Magus really shines, like, this is, like, where he's the best suited for everything in the entire game is right here. So that being said, because I need to level him up anyways and learn some more TP, he's the only character I have left that still needs some TP to unlock his remaining abilities, then I, he's just a really good choice for all this. And because his shadow abilities do more damage than anything else he has, if I just keep using shadow abilities, I'll guarantee that I'm going to do a lot of damage to everything anyway. So once you've defeated all the enemies in the area, you'll have this little cinematic point where your characters have a conversation just commenting on the fact that they've destroyed everything, and then they'll also note the fact that there is a sapling here on the ground. Now before you move on, you need to actually inspect the sapling again, so you need to walk in front of it and press A to have your characters interact with it, and this will just, they'll just be like, oh look, it's a sapling, and they don't do anything, but that is a required step, so what you want to do is just like walk into it, it's kind of a little bit awkward actually, like you have to be at just the right position, otherwise nothing happens, so what you want to do is just keep butt mashing A, keep moving at different angles and stuff until you do it. I find like being on the bottom and facing up is the angle that works the best for me, but uh, just be aware of that. You have to keep inspecting it until your characters acknowledge its presence. Um, but, uh, but this is one of the required steps for one of the upcoming side quests. One quick note about the gameplay right now is that I didn't open all the chests right then because I, for a second I was hesitating because I was thinking maybe it was like Frog Side Quest where you want to open all the chests in the future and then open all the chests in the past so you can literally open every single chest twice. I wasn't sh for a moment I was hesitating because I wasn't sure if it was like that and then I remembered that this area isn't like that at all. So you can open them in any order so just go ahead and open all the chests and that would be great. So I didn't actually do that at this point. I'll be doing it later on in this recording. Now once you return to Lost Sanctum what you'll find is that all of the uh, reptites, you know, after we defeated all the reptites that were in Reptite Lair and Tyranno Lair, then Tyranno Lair blew up and all the reptites are gone and then it's just humans are dominating everything throughout the rest of history and that's what ended up happening. However, some of the reptites apparently survived and they're here in Lost Sanctum. Now instead of enemies though, they are just individuals who are just intelligent. Again, remember that in 65 million BC, the reptites were the smart ones and the humans were the ones who were still progressing and evolving and stuff, so they were not very intelligent at that time. So the reptites here are surprised to see humans that are actually intelligent and are not kind of silly and basic or whatever. So, that all being said, the reptites here are weak though. They're not physically strong, which is ironic because reptites used to rule everything, but I suppose you could say the same thing about humans that, you know, it's because of human technology is the reason that we dominated everything and became the, uh, you know, the top of the food chain and everything. So it's kind of the same thing with the reptites. Anyways, we are strong, the reptites are not, so they're asking us for help and they're wondering if we would be willing to complete quests for them in order to get rewards. So how this functions is that the Lost Sanctum is going to be our hub and the surrounding areas are the various places where we're going to be getting our quest items, then we come back here and turn it in and we just keep doing that over and over again. Um, now these objectives sometimes just results in us going back and forth to the same area over and over and over again though, we're just killing monsters along the way because they reappear every single time. And it ends up feeling a little bit arbitrary, like, honestly it feels like they weren't super creative. I feel like the quests themselves, the ideas of the quests are super creative, but the areas themselves are just super repetitive and tedious, so I kind of find this whole side quest, or this whole area, kind of annoying. Now this results in something like three to five hours of gameplay. I'm just going to be fast forwarding through all this, so I'm just going to be skipping ahead straight to everything we're going to do. Now as far as notable things that we can do here in the Lost Sanctum, um, you can go over to the top right, there is a reptite that you can speak with to sleep at an inn for free. This will allow you to get, uh, to be able to heal and restore your MP of all the people in your party. Now that's all wonderful. There is some shops around here too, although the shops don't really have anything super cool right now. We will be able to buy some really high-end consumables later though. So once you've cleared the forest in the top right corner for the first time, then after that we'll finally be able to start accepting quests. So speak with the reptite in the bottom left corner to accept the golden hand hammer quest. Now he says he's looking for a legendary hammer, he, she, that um, they just heard about in Legends, and I'm not sure where they heard these Legends about, I guess apparently older than 65 million BC, but our next step is to speak to the Reptite just to the right, and this one explains that if you find some golden sand, which is found in the Great Southern Swamp to the south, then you should be able to sprinkle that on a sapling in order to make 
make the sapling grow well. Now in this area just south of the Lost Sanctum, you will find a bunch of new enemies. So king frogs are, they are more susceptible to physical in general, so use physical damage on them, and otherwise they absorb uh, light. So just don't use any lightning attacks on them, and just use either hard physical in general. You can use text if you want to, but even just your regular attacks, take care of them pretty good. So I'd recommend that, either, otherwise you want to just use any magic other than light, so like fire or shadow or something works great. The only other notable new enemy in this area is called a death creeper. It's like this purple sludge monster. Now these enemies will absorb shadow so it heals them instead. However, they also like have some pretty nasty attacks, um, so they hurt really hard. They don't really have that much health. They only have like a little bit over a thousand, but I'd recommend you take them out right away because they can be a problem. So open all the chests in this area if you wish. There's nothing really super, super notable to point out that's down here, but um, otherwise what I am doing, by the way, is I am just exploring every nook and cranny of the map in order to get it fully discovered so that my bottom screen is all completely visible. It's one of the things that I'm doing. In order to proceed, all you have to do is just go to the little sandy patch that's in the bottom left corner of the map. It's kind of like middle middle of the screen-ish, but kind of towards the bottom left, and there's a little sandy patch there that has a sparkly. Inspect that to find the golden sand. Now again, this is only visible if you spoke with the second Reptite after accepting the golden hammer quest. If you accept the golden hammer quest, the Reptite right next to him will inform you about the golden sand. I find this all very frustrating about the Lost Sanctum. There's a lot of the quests are like this, where there's like an extra arbitrary step where they don't, there's no indication that you need to do that, and yet it is a requirement, and if you don't do that, then you cannot proceed. There's a lot of little stuff like that. I feel like that's just bad writing. I'm not sure, or like they just didn't really think it through very well, or like, I don't know. It just feels a little bit too arbitrary, or like in order to proceed, in order to guarantee you don't have problems, it's almost like you need to just like talk with everybody all the time, just to guarantee you don't potentially miss something. There's no indication, there's, like, there's no way for you to know. You know what I mean? And so I find that uh, frustrating. Because it's really irritating to go to the, like, go to the place where you know you're supposed to go and nothing happens, you know? Because you didn't, there was an extra step that you didn't realize even existed. So our next objective is to head to Millennia Forest, and there is a reptite in the bottom right corner you can speak with optionally if you wish, and he just explains that there is awesome trees that grow here and stuff that you can craft some really cool things with, which don't matter too much. Now you can continue on through this area. Again, most of the enemies have respawned. You can kill them if you wish, doesn't really matter, or you can sneak past them. Now real quick, before we move on too much further, I just want to point out that there's an enemy up ahead that is super, super rare that a lot of players will probably never see, and it's called a Wonder Rock that can be charmed or defeated to give you a Lumisite shard, which can then be used to craft one of the most powerful chest pieces in the entire game. It's a Luka exclusive item that gives you complete immunity to all elemental attacks, which yes, is just as crazy as it sounds. Now, I'll talk more about this more thoroughly in the Dimensional Vortex video, but I just, what we want to do is increase your speed like crazy and wear equipment that gives you haste as well as status immunity, because these things have a tendency to run away, and so you want to make sure that you can attack them fast enough. So keep an eye out for them, and if you see one, then quickly swap out your equipment, max out your speed and haste, and then put Ayla and Marl in your party so you can use Twin Charm right away, because you can charm them faster than you can kill them. In addition to that, you probably want to wear status protection because it can cast lock on you, which will prevent you from using techs. So yeah, keep an eye out for blue-gray rocks and charm them as soon as possible. Now, my understanding of how it works too is there's only one location per map where they can be found here in the Lost Sanctum and also Dimensional Vortex. So like here in the Millennial Forest, it's right there in the middle. So if you are looking to hunt Wonder Rocks in order to get some Luminite, then you can like run through and go to the middle and see if there's a Wonder Rock, and if there's not, then just leave the area and come back and then try again. So you can just keep doing that over and over again until you get one to appear. It's a very rare chance. Some areas are better than others, and I'll talk more about that towards the end of the video. The reason I point it out is because if you are doing Lost Sanctum with me right now, just kind of keep on the eye, keep an eye out for it, and I'll explain more at the end of the video, like tactics for how to kill them. So yes, if you're doing the Lost Sanctum quest and you're following along with this video, just like keep playing the game, keep doing your thing, and then if you see one, then pause and then look up look up the end of this video and I'll show you tactics on how to kill them. So like, don't don't fight them as soon as you see them, just like prepare for it ahead of time and then do it. Now, once you get to the end of Millennia Forest, you gotta like, again, just keep inspecting the sapling, keep like interacting with it over and over and over again and keep wandering around it until you find the sweet spot where it finally interacts with it. I don't know why this one's so hard to, to select. I don't know why, but it's a little bit aggravating. So just keep doing that until finally one of your characters will sprinkle the sand on it, which allows it to grow well. So next, we want to check up on the sapling after it's had a chance to grow. So you want to go back to the epic and then change the time period to 600 AD. You want to go back to the Lost Sanctum, which is a little bit over to the left because the continents moved over the years, and then enter. Now, you could have optionally come here in 600 AD, and I showed that at the beginning of the video, and it was overrun with fiends, so they were everywhere, and there's a bunch of monsters here. But because we cleared out the monsters from Millennia Forest in the past, then now the reptites 
had a chance to thrive and they never went extinct. So as a result, now Lost Sanctum in the future is not overrun with monsters and instead there are reptites here. Now, they are apparently afraid of us because they've never seen humans before. However, they do kind of recognize us because they have some oral traditions that have been passed down about legendary heroes that helped them in the past. So the events that took place before have now led to them trusting us and as a result we can now do quests here in this time period as well. I do gotta say I'm like both really impressed and also really disappointed with the reptites. Like, you know, on the one hand they had an oral tradition that remained intact enough for 65 million years that they still recognize us as human and they know that we can be trusted, which is, that's crazy, that's a pretty good oral tradition. However, I'm also disappointed because the reptites are supposed to be as intelligent as humans, and yet they've made no technological advancements at all this entire time. Like, come on, 65 million years, you could have done something. I know there is that phrase that necessity is the mother of all invention and like, you know, there, maybe there's just no need for them to upgrade in any way. And like, it's not like they have a lot of access to resources. Like actually all the areas surrounding the caves is all full of monsters and stuff anyway. So it's not like they can leave and get a bunch of stuff. Um, ironically enough, even if you go back to 65 million BC, even though we cleared out the forest, the forest is still full of enemies. Every time you go there, the enemies are, re are back again. They reappear. So like, I'm not really sure that we accomplished anything. So maybe the reptiles can't even leave the cave. And that's part of why they've been stuck here this entire time. The Lost Sanctum in this time period is pretty much the exact same as the, as the past, like literally all the characters are in the exact same positions in there. Like we have the shop, we have the inn, we have the sparkly, we can save it. We have all the quest givers in the same locations too. Like it's the same kind of thing. It's same, same. Um, so I'm not even gonna talk about it. Continuing on to the top right though, when you're ready to proceed to enter Millennia Forest. Again, this area is the exact same. The forest itself has like a different color grass, but otherwise everything here is the same. The one thing that's notable that's different though, is that all of the chests are different. There are different chests here and they all contain different things. And notably too, here at the end, there are two chests that are worth pointing out one of them has a mega elixir and the other one has the dragon head so i'm not going to bother showing the millennial forest in general go ahead and open chests and stuff so next what happens is, as soon as you get to the end what your characters will find is that the tree has been cut down has grown over the years but it's been cut down the boss has then turned it into a golden hammer which is actually what we're after so that kind of works out in our favor now the boss will appear as soon as you reach kind of this little area in between the trees right here um a little bit to the right as soon as you walk through the middle of the either through the middle of the trees or through the middle of the grass there it will initiate the boss encounter what you want to do is swap out your characters until you have a party you're happy with. What I highly recommend is just do hard magic damage. So just use only characters that can use magic damage, pure magic. Um, just so you know, a lot of dual techs are actually half physical, half magic, and this boss is highly resistant to the physical portion of tech. So we want to use techs that are pure magic. So that being said, I would highly recommend that you bring Marl and Luca because they can use Anti-Code Bomb 3. It's just a super good spell. You should easily be able to win even with just them. Now, as far as a third slot, you can use healers like Robo or Frog would be good because they can heal the whole party. We can also do a little bit of magic damage, but this is kind of nothing really to write home about. Now, if you want to use pure magic damage for your last slot, you're probably better off either using Chrono if you've pumped a bunch of magic stat into him, and then you can have him use Luminaire. Otherwise, you can use Magus, and that would be really good too. As far as the boss's attacks go, he has a couple of different ones that will hit anywhere from from like pretty low damage to all the way up to like 500 or even 800 damage if you have low physical defense. So it's not really too big a deal. As long as you have some pretty high armor though, or you're high enough level, it shouldn't really be that much of a problem. So you shouldn't have to worry about it too much. Now, the one thing to note though, is he does have the rush ability, which is similar to like a, the news headbutt attack that will then reduce your HP to one. So you just want to be ready with a healer or somebody to use a potion or something to heal somebody to get them beyond that um, as soon as possible if that happens right away. The only other thing worth noting for this particular boss is the fact that every time that you use a magic based attack it will also increase the damage that he deals slightly so it gives him a buff and so it stacks up and he steadily ramps up and does more and more damage. However, I still recommend if you just hit him with really hard hitting magic damage you will kind of whittle him down pretty well and it shouldn't take too long because if you can do over a thousand damage per hit then you should easily be able to keep up and and it doesn't take very long before you defeat him. He only has like just shy of 6,000 life. So if you can do over a thousand damage every hit, it won't take very long to defeat him at all. But yes, magic damage dealers is what you want. If you do uh, attacks like say Fire Sword, for example, then Chrono's portion of that damage will do nothing. And then meanwhile, Luke is the only one doing damage basically. He just takes so little physical damage that's just terrible. You can do it. It just would take a very long time. So once you make it back, you want to probably sleep at the nearby inn and then go down the ladder to speak with the elder who will then thank you for clearing out all the monsters from the forest in this time period as well. And he will gift you with a mega elixir, which is super nice. That's all we had to do here. You can speak with the various reptites if you like, just to get a kind of an idea on the types of quests they will eventually have available to them, but we can't do anything with them for right now. So return all the way back to 65 million BC using the epic and then speak with the reptite in the bottom left corner to then be gifted with your reward, which is 100,000 G. 
I don't understand. Like, here we have these reptites stuck in a cave with no technology and, like, no way to defend themselves. They have no trade, no nothing, and yet they have, like, tons and tons of cash on them and really good rewards. <laughs> you think they could have used some of those, you know, like, giving us epic weapons as rewards, and yet they could have used those weapons them to defend themselves? I don't know. For our next quest, you want to speak with the reptite in the top left corner, and this one is requesting that you go find the prism stone, which is on top of Mount Emerald, which is to the south. So what you want to do is you want to leave the Lost Sanctum through the south, so take us to the Great Southern Swamp. You want to run through here, I'm just going to ignore all the enemies, and I'm not going to show all this combat anymore from mo moving forward. So continue to the far bottom right corner of the Great Southern Swamp. This will lead to Mount Emerald, where we have a boss battle. Now this boss is all about doing counters, and he has a bunch of pretty nasty elemental counters, so depending on which element you're using, it can actually really hurt and it hits your whole party. Now on the flip side of that though, using physical, he doesn't take as much physical damage, however a lot of our physical techs actually do pretty decent damage anyway, so even though he's resistant and he'll block a chunk of it anyways, it doesn't matter if you can overcome that, you'll still just do more damage overall anyways. The other fun thing to know about that is a lot of his counters for physical are just status effects. They don't do any damage, they're just status effects, however, if you have status protection, it doesn't matter. So wearing like Angel's Tiara or Vigilant Helms or Shala's Amulet or like Nova um, armor or whatever will prevent that entirely so you don't have to worry about it. So meanwhile, you can just go to town using a bunch of other techs. You can either use dual techs or single techs, whatever you want to do. I'd recommend you put the gold stud on whoever's going to have the highest MP cost spells. But as a result, you can do a lot of damage without actually having to worry about the repercussions at all. So even though physical doesn't really work that well against this boss, in a lot of ways it's a lot safer because you don't take any damage from all of his counterattacks in general. So, like, yeah, it's literally, it nullifies all of his counterattacks, which is the really scary thing about this boss. The only other scary thing he has is because he's a new, he has that attack that reduces your HP to one. You're seeing that a lot more towards the end of the game where a lot of enemies have that attack, but typically it's just been news that do that so far. But yeah, you get the idea. So you can use either dual text or triple text. So like 3D attack or triple raid slash triple attack is pretty good as well if you're gonna have chrono in the mix. Um, otherwise, for good single text, you can use uh, rapid fire fist, otherwise known as Uzi punch. You can use triple kick. Is like triple kick is actually not all that great, and neither is aerial strike, otherwise known as leap slash. However, drop down is a really good ability between them as well. And also with frog and able on the same team, you can also use slurp kiss, which is a really good counter. That'll like almost full heal your entire party really well if you have some magic on Ayla. Like, honestly, one other alternative is just have, like, both Ayla and Frog just constantly healing Robo and have him use the Crisis Arm with Rapid Fire Fist, and you can just destroy this boss. The Crisis Arm is just super strong. The other method is to use magical attacks. Now, the thing to know about this is the boss counters with the same element as whatever you used. Now, this actually makes it really easy, because all you have to do is just equip the appropriate colored plates, and then those attacks that the boss counters with will then heal you instead. So if you wear some red plate, in this case I'm using all fire because it's really easy, because I have two characters that have a really good dual tech of fire, and then I also have Magus who can do some fire damage as well. Now it's not as high as like his shadow damage, but this guarantees that the boss is healing me all the time. Now as a result, I don't actually need a healer at all. So I can just go to town and just keep doing damage attacks. Even if the boss does use his headbutt ability to reduce my HP to one, all I have to do is attack, and then I'll instantly get above one HP and I'm fine. I suppose his leap could technically do enough damage to kill me, but I probably have enough physical defense on all these characters that even if he did do that, I wouldn't die at this point in my particular case. I would say fire is the easiest one to do this with, although as an alternative, probably lightning would be the next most easiest one because you can have Magus, Robo, and Chrono that can all do lightning damage, and then that way you have a, a lot of characters that can do that. Another alternative is you can go ahead and use, uh, like, some dual techs that do elemental damage, such as, like, Ice Tackle or, like, Fire Sword, for example. Those are that do half physical damage and half magical damage. Although, just so you know, like, this boss is more resistant to physical damage. The funny thing is, a lot of the physical damage attacks tend to do more single target damage in general. So like 3D attack, for example, hits really, really hard. But yeah, so like this is just great. Like every time the boss goes ahead and just uses a really nasty attack, I just follow up with an attack myself and I'm fine. Now, one other nuance you can do here that's kind of fun is because we're healing with the fire attacks, you can also use this to your advantage. Like for example, Robo with the Crisis Arm with Rapid Fire Fist, right? Did really, really good. If I have him as one character, as long as he has status protection, the counter attack only hits him and he's immune to it because he has the status immunity, right? And then meanwhile, I follow up with a fire attack and then that causes the boss to counter with fire, which then heals everybody, including Robo, so it guarantees that he's always at max HP, so he always has an HP ending in 9, so he always does good damage. So, you can mix and match these two things, because you only need status protection on whoever's doing only physical damage. 
So the most important thing to realize about Mount Emerald is that there's a couple enemies that are you need to use magical and there's a couple enemies you need to use physical. Now the easiest way to do magical damage is just to use a character that has some really hard hitting magic damage that hits the whole screen. So you can just wear like a gold stud or something like that and just use that every single time. You'll easily get through all of these enemies no problem. In particular you have these uh, birds that are called Jade Wings and they are super resistant to physical, like very very highly physical resistant. So you want to use magic damage on them. So if you're just using magic damage to blow up the whole screen every time anyways, then it's totally fine. You don't even have to worry about them. So that's what I'd recommend you do is put like a gold stud on Magus or Luca or something and just destroy everything. Now in my case I am trying to get more TP on Magus so I'm just going to use him anyways. Now meanwhile for my other two slots I'm using Chrono and Ayla because I have some really good single target physical techs I can use on them. And if it comes down to it I can also just use like Falcon Strike to hit all the enemies in a line. And a lot of times a lot of the enemies that are that I need to use them for stuff like that are going to be in a line anyway. So it actually works out really good. So I'd recommend Chrono and Ayla unless you still have other characters you need to get some tech on. But yeah, I'd recommend basically like either Chrono, Ayla, Robo, and then optionally Frog too for some physical damage for your remaining slots. So yes, the Jade Wings have a nasty Confuse ability, and they're also highly resistant to physical, so just use magic damage, you should be able to take care of them right away, but you want to, might want to consider wearing some uh, status immunity gear so that you don't get confused all the time. Now otherwise, we also have another enemy here called a Hercules Beetle, and they can also apply a status effect in the form of sleep, which is super annoying as well. So if you have some status immunity for that, it would help as well. However, they are immune to magic, so any magical attacks of any kind will not work on them, so you have to use physical. So what I'd recommend you do is just use a really hard-hitting physical attack otherwise you can also use like a really good dual tech would work as well uh, but yes they're they are completely immune to any magical portion of any dual techs if you use like fire sword for example it does like almost no damage you're way better off using just frenzy by itself so once you finally make it all the way to the top you want to go to the right and you'll find the prism stone here at the very top of the mountain Woo! so that's all we had to do here so we're just going to return all the way back to the village and fight our way through the enemies again now one quick comment as long as we're here just as a quick note is i hear one of the best places to find a wonder rock to get the illuminate is actually just here towards the top of the mountain. There's an area towards the end where there's two Hercules beetles right before the end of uh, Mount Emerald, and that is a pretty tried and true place where you can find them here in the Lost Sanctum. However, I, th I hear also overall it's a lot easier to get them in the Dimensional Vortex. I haven't actually recorded that part yet, but I will find that location as well. I hear that's the best place overall to find them. So once you make it all the way back to Lost Sanctum, you want to hand in the, the Prism Stone quest with the Reptite in the far top left corner to get a whole bunch of capsules of reward. Now next, if you go over to the far top right corner, there's a Reptite here just below the inn, and it explains that if you could possibly find a second Prism Stone, you could then merge them together to make the legendary Saint Stone, and it would love to see that. So this is the next quest. What you want to do is enter the Sanctuary here in the top middle of Lost Sanctum, and then place the Prism Stone on one of the pedestals. Next, we're going to go to the future so that we can see the Prism Stone there. So exit the Lost Sanctum, get back in the Epic, change the time period back to 600 AD, then re-enter the Lost Sanctum and go to the Sanctuary once again. Now unfortunately there is an elder that is blocking our path this time and he says that if you want to enter the sanctuary you're going to have to prove your worth because apparently doing the previous quest wasn't enough. And of course a suitable challenge to make sure that we are truly worthy would be to go to Millennia Forest which is exactly where we went last time. Uh, does this mean we're double worthy because this is what we did the previous time that he said that he rewarded us for before? Whatever. Anyways you want to go to the far top left corner and inspect the sparkly to get the rept mark and of course it is in the far top left corner which is the farthest place away from the entrance you can possibly possibly get, because why wouldn't it be? You want to grab that, return to the Elder, and then show it to him, and he'll finally let you pass so you can get inside the sanctuary. This part feels bad to be like, he's all like, oh, I'm really reluctant to trust you, but okay, I'll let you into our sacred sanctuary, and we go in there, and we take the prism stone from the future, and we return to the past with it. <laughs> like, oh, I'm sure he's glad he let us through. So anyways, you want to return to 65 million BC, place the prism stone from the future next to the prism stone from the past in the sanctuary, the two will merge, which then makes the saint stone. This makes no sense. If we have have the prism stone from the future that means we can't get rid of the one from the past otherwise the one in the future doesn't exist right so why is this doesn't make any sense it's like they keep saying for this walkthrough though like what they keep the whole theme is like i spit in the face of your causality i'm a big fan of fantasy and science fiction and stuff like that and i've seen lots of you know time travel -y episodes and shows and stuff like that but this one was just a little bit much because there's a difference between like trying to change fate so that something bad doesn't happen versus like like changing the mass or like I don't even know like where does the mass for this thing even come from like if it didn't exist in the first place or in the future then it can't bring back to the past to even do this th I don't know it doesn't make sense it's like doesn't yeah anyway <laughs> just like it took it a little too far for me and I just can't quite hit the I believe button so once you've completed this quest you want to show the saint stone to the reptite and then it will 
reward you with the dragon arm, which is an upgrade for Robo. This is a little bit nicer than the Terraton arm, and it's one of the better arms in the game for him. Um, however, the Crisis arm is still better in specific situations. For the next quest, we want to return to 600 AD and then go back to the Lost Sanctum, and in the bottom left corner, there is a Reptite here that has another quest for us. This is in the same position as the Golden Hammer quest, but that was in the past. This is in the future. I find this very confusing because everything looks the same. Now, what this Reptite says is that there is a strange character that is at the base of the mountain that is waiting for some people to come back because he's looking for a strong opponent. So, you want to return to the mountain to go back to the Southern Glade. This has changed this time because it's no longer a swamp. So, this area has changed a little bit. There's a bunch of chests here you can grab as well. I'll be showing that here in a little bit. So, continue on towards the mountain, and here at the base of the mountain, the new has meanwhile been training for 65 million years, and he's ready to face off against us once again. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I find this intimidating. Like, seriously, somebody can bulk up in just a couple months, but this guy's had uh, quite a few more years than that to get ready for us, so he's probably gotten really beefy in that time. You want to continue on towards the right, and you'll see that there is a ladder that is actually broken, so we cannot climb the mountain at this exact time. So after you've inspected it, our next step is you can optionally go back to the Lost Sanctum and speak with the Reptite over to the right instead, and this one will say that you, you cannot make a ladder. However, he can, you can probably get one that's made out of vines. So he wants to search the Southern Glade for vines. Speaking with this Reptite is actually completely optional, you don't have to do that. So instead, you can just go directly to Southern Glade and go directly to getting these sturdy vines right away. So they're just in the top right corner here, it looks like a blue sparkly here on the ground, so just go ahead and interact with it to find it. And then you want to return to the mountain, go back to where the broken ladder is, and you'll have this scene in which our characters are talking about how they can't attach the vines because we're here at the bottom. We need to be at the top in order to lower them down. So, now that we have done that, this is a required step, by the way. You have to come here and inspect it again, just for our characters to say, Oh yeah, I guess I can't do this after all. So next, you want to return to 65 million BC, and at this point, there's actually another quest we can accept to uh, do multiple steps at the same time to save you steps. So what you want to do is go speak with the Reptite in the bottom right corner and explains there's a cave nearby that's really dark, you're going to need some kind of light source to see. Now, after you've spoken with that Reptite, you can speak with another nearby Reptite in the top right, the one that we did the Saint Stone quest with. If you speak with this one, it explains that if you were to leave the Prisma Stone somewhere where it could soak up light, that maybe it would charge up and you'd have a light source from it. So now finally go to Mount Emerald here in 65 million BC and then go on top of the ladder. And as soon as you do, then our characters will then place the vines to make another ladder nearby that we can now use in the future. Now, I don't know about you guys. Now, this set of vines is like, this is the most laddery looking vines I've ever seen, I swear. <laughs> So at this point, if you have completed the Saint Stone quest previously and you have spoke with the, uh, the Reptites here in 65 million BC to accept the Dark Cavern quest, then if you go to the very top of Mount Emerald here in 65 million BC, you can then place the Saint Stone back at the same place where we got the original Prisma Stone, and then it will charge up light over time. Now this is really great because we're about to come to the top of Mount Emerald in 600 AD. So next you want to go back to the epic, change the time period back to 600 AD, go all the way back to Mount Emerald and climb all the way to the top. So because we placed those vines in the past, there's now a ladder here in the futures. And other than that, Mount Emerald is very similar to how it was in 65 million BC. The music's the same, the enemies are the same. There's nothing really different. One comment about it is that all of the chests, um, you can get them all over again and they have different things inside them. Now most of those don't really matter. It's just like gold and shelters and stuff doesn't really matter. But there is one chest at the very top that has a mermaid helm, and I think that is super valuable, so just as a quick comment. So this next boss battle is fairly tough. He has a couple, like, typical new attacks where he'll either have your HP or reduce it all the way down to one, so you just want to have a healer ready to counteract that as soon as possible. Otherwise, he has some fairly hard-hitting physical attacks, but they're not too bad. Um, like I say, those are will always have or always reduce you to one, the two new attacks that he has. So it's not really physical so much, so physical defense doesn't matter too much, although eventually he has overdrive, and that is fairly rough as well. However, the more damaging thing by far is going to be Thunderburst, which he uses fairly rarely. However, that can hit really, really hard. It can easily one-shot one of your characters unless you have high enough magic defense. If you're in the, like, 60 magic defense area, you'll probably just get one-shot to that every single time. But if not, if you have closer to, like, 80 or 90 magic defense or more, then you'll probably reduce it to the point where it's pretty manageable and it doesn't matter too much. But to s save yourself from dying to that, I recommend that you put on the White Plate. Again, his physical attacks don't really matter so much because Devil's Drop and Life Shaver are just purely percentage-based, and it has nothing to do with your actual physical defense, your stamina, or your actual armor don't affect it whatsoever, so that doesn't matter. So even though the armor of the White Plate is less at this point, it doesn't really matter because his physical attacks are not really what we're worried about, it's the magic damage by far is going to be much more deadly, so that's why I recommend putting on the White Plate even though it's less armor. The next thing to know about this boss is that he has a life steal that steals around 200 life every single time you hit him. It doesn't, I think it has a short cooldown, so if you, like, attack in quick succession, you attack with one character and then attack with another, then his absorb hasn't recharged, so you can avoid a little bit of damage 
damage that way by attacking with your whole party all at the same time. Now at the same time though, I'd recommend you use as few attacks as possible. Just use like fewer, harder hitting attacks instead of a whole bunch of smaller ones because that way you can avoid healing him as much as possible. Now once he reaches about half HP, he'll use an ability called Power Increased, which will then change his elemental barrier and it will also unlock the ability Overdrive for him, which is a really nasty physical attack that hits everybody on the screen. It hurts really bad. Um, now what this does, once he uses Power Increased, is then he will absorb all elements and will heal him instead, except for one. Now you can use Process of Elimination and bring a bunch of characters trying to figure out what that element is that he's now vulnerable to. However, I don't think it's worth it at all. So even though he takes less damage from physical, the more tried and true method to defeat this boss is just to focus on hard physical and just use a whole bunch of really hard hitting attacks over and over again and just defeat him that way because it's just much more reliable. You can try messing around with elemental, but the problem is like even if you bring say Magus, like you're using Lightning 2 or whatever, then Lightning 2 doesn't do very much damage and he will steal 200 health from him every time you use it anyway. So you can do it, but it'll be a war of attrition. You'll be here for a long time just trying to whittle him down. So it's way better off just using really hard hitting physical techs because if you can get over that threshold for however much damage he's blocking, then you're doing good damage anyway. So it doesn't really matter. The amount of damage you're going to do total with physical is going to be higher if you use some really hard hitting uh, dual techs. So that being said, here's the same battle again, showing a different team composition so you can see other strategies. Again, I have the white plate put on all of my characters. If you are don't have that option or you don't have enough white plates, then on your last character you can put on, like, uh, you know, the Flea's Bustier would be a really good one. That's an accessory that gives you, I think it's 12 magic defense off the top of my head. So that increases it by quite a bit. So if you have like a chest piece that does that, like say the Moonbeam armor, and then the uh, accessory as well. You can probably reduce it down to like 200 damage or less, or even 100 damage with Thunder Burst, and then you're taking like no damage at all. Now this guy is more vulnerable to magic initially, so you can't start out that way. He only absorbs shadow, and meanwhile he's vulnerable to everything else. He takes more damage from a higher percentage from magic damage initially, but once he uses power increased at half HP, then he'll switch and you should basically just rely only on physical at that point would be my recommendation. So this particular team composition, I have a couple like full party heals and some pretty hard hitting single target heals. Right now I'm using Cure 2 with Frog. Now this boss also has a pretty nasty one shot ability called Death's Rainbow. What this does is it has a very low success rate. I think it's like a 20% success chance or something like that. And then meanwhile, you know, 80% of the time it doesn't work. So it fails most of the time. However, it can just one shot one of your guys regardless of magic defense, regardless of what your resistances are, everything, doesn't matter. They'll just one-shot one of your characters, it's terrible. So between Thunderburst and Death's Rainbow, this guy could potentially be just knocking out your characters one after another, um, and it's pretty awful. So, in order to counteract that, you're probably going to want to use, like, Star Rays with Chrono, or Star Arise with Marl, or use Athenian Waters and then follow up with a heal to on one character to bring them back to life. So you're probably going to have to keep doing that over and over again. Just be aware, it's an annoying thing, but it is potentially something you're going to have to do. Now, if you have this particular team composition, something else that you can do, which is pretty nice, is you can use the triple attack, uh, triple raid slash triple attack, and that'll hit pretty hard. Now, this is a pretty man efficient ability, and the damage on it is okay. It's pretty decent. However, uh, this boss doesn't even have that much life. Like, honestly, I'm actually surprised that this particular tech does so much damage. It is definitely higher damage. It's one of the most efficient spells in the game, actually. Um, I don't think that, you know, like I say, the total amount of damage per second that you can do, typically it's better to do uh, a dual tech and a single tech. Just generally speaking, it's always better. However, as far as mana efficiency, a lot of times triple techs are more mana efficient, so you can do more of them before you're out of mana, unless you're using like the gold stud or something, of course. Now just to show one more battle, just to show an extreme way of doing this boss fight, is again, I have white plate on all my characters. I'm using Marl just to heal Robo so that his HP stays at 999, because if his HP ends in 9, then the Crisis Arm does crazy damage. Now the Crisis Arm will affect many different abilities. One of the best ones that it affects is actually Beast Toss. I've talked about this a couple different times throughout the walkthrough, but I haven't had an opportunity to show it because most of the bosses we've been fighting have been really big, and so it wasn't very practical for them. So the other thing I did too is I put the Prism Spectacles on both Robo and Ayla. I have one for each of them. Now Beast Toss actually scales higher with Ayla's stats, what are like a higher percentage of the damage comes from her. However, uh, Robo is the one with the crazy weapon that just scales really, really crazy. So of the two of them, I think that it's still better to put it on Robo, even though it's like half or like one third of the total damage comes from him for this particular ability. But because his damage is so much higher in this particular case, I think it makes up for it. But anyways, I have the prison specs on both of them. So thus, I'm just destroying this boss. He only has 8,800 life. 
So I'm doing almost half his HP with every single beast toss that I'm doing currently in this particular battle. And again, something crazy to realize about those numbers you just saw is the fact that he's high physical resist, so he's resisting a big portion of that damage already, and I'm just like cutting through it anyways and just destroying him, which is funny. So at this point, after we beat him to a pulp, he finally got that out of his system, we can just be friends after all, like, I don't even know. he's been holding this grudge and preparing for 65 million years, and he's like, eh, it'll be fine, like, whatever. <laughs> like, what kind of reaction? It's such a Japanese thing, like, seriously. I don't actually know of any other cultures where this is, like, a thing, but it just seems strange to me that they always do this in Japanese, like, media and stuff. There is a nearby sparkly, so if you want to use a shelter after that tough battle, then you might want to do that, which might be kind of a nice thing to get back. Otherwise, you can just swap out characters for the return journey. Now, at this point, if you have accepted the Dark Cavern quest and you place the Saint Stone here on top of Mount Emerald like I recommended, then if you go over to the right right now here in, six, in 600 AD, you can pick up the Waystone, which is really convenient. It saves you a couple trips up Mount Emerald, so it's super nice. So I'd highly recommend you do that. Next, you want to work your way back to... Lost Sanctum, so you can hand in the new quest. What you want to do is speak with the bottom left Reptite here in 600 AD, and he'll give you the Nova Armor as reward. The next quest is in the same time period to speak with one of the Reptites in the top right corner, who explains that they're looking to build a bridge up on top of the mountain um, just to span across the mountains. I'm actually not sure what this accomplishes exactly, like, the, it leads to a dungeon eventually, but other than that, I'm not sure what the purpose is. It's not for trade, it's not for, like, convenience or anything, it's not, like, I mean, yes, it leads to a dungeon, so I suppose if they're just curious, then I suppose that makes sense, but other than that, I'm not sure what the point is. I don't know why we're even doing this. Maybe the Reptites have something similar similar to the Guinness Book of World Records, maybe it's something like that. So in order to fulfill this Reptite's dream, we're going to need to collect three different quest items. So the first one is here in 600 AD, just simply go to Southern Glade and then go over to the far top left. Now as long as we're here, you can go ahead and open all the remaining chests. I've gotten all the stuff on the right side, but I haven't gotten all the stuff on the left side yet. There's nothing really super worth noting, just some gold and stuff. So just go ahead and open all the chests, continue on towards the top left where you'll enter the cavern. Now, there's a bunch of goodies here, the most notably is just the fact that there is some like hidden alcoves, kind of. you gotta walk through the walls basically. Um, it's basically just a lower one, so once you get kind of the middle of the area, you go kind of towards the bottom right and just keep walking against the southern wall and you'll eventually see this hidden area where you can reach a uh, reach some chests. Do the same thing on the bottom left and the same thing in the top left as well. There is a like a cavern entrance, another like place you can go to in the top left as well. However, that leads on towards the castle and we can't actually access that just yet. Anyway, the chest in the top left corner is the one that contains the steel ingot and that's all we came here for. There is also some of these uh, death creepers here, which is these creepy enemies that are, they will absorb shadow damage. So if you're gonna use Magus, you would need to use something else. Um, generally speaking, I think it's best to use physical damage against them because they take more damage from that than they do from magic stuff in general. Otherwise, you can just use some other element. Like if I had Chrono use Luminaire, for example, that would probably be fine as well. So next, return to the epic, change it back to 65 million BC, and then in this time period, speak with the bottom left Reptite to borrow the Golden Hammer. And again, this is, again, bringing back what I was talking about earlier in the walkthrough is I hate how we have all these borrowing things in this game and yet we don't actually get the opportunity to even return the item. I so wish I could bring it back. Um, so next you want to go to the far top right corner, go to Millennial Woods, and here you can speak with the, or Millennial Forest, excuse me, and then there is a reptite up here at the entrance only in 65 million BC, and it explains that because the monsters had recently, remember at the very beginning they were saying that the monsters had chopped down a tree and then they had placed another sapling there is what had happened. So the Godwood, meanwhile, it was left behind. This was the previous like golden tree that was there before. So they have meanwhile, they were trying to figure out a use for it that would be put to good use so it just wouldn't be wasted. So uh, by speaking with this reptite, we are asking to take the godwood away. So this is our third and final object. So return to 600 AD and bring this to the reptite here. As reward, we will then receive a haste helm, which in my opinion is one of the best items in the game. Just super, super good. Although the angel's tiara on the girls is just better, but we can only get those in the arena of ages. So at this point, this Reptite will then leave and head off towards the mountains, and we have the scene where it's walking off. Now, at this point, the next objective is to actually speak with its neighbor, and that will give us the next quest. However, this will only take place after you have reset the area. So in order to accomplish this, you speak with this Reptite now, but it doesn't actually do anything. So in order to get the dialogue to move on, just simply leave the area, come all the way back, so just meow, come back, and then I think I just, I actually leave, leave by taking the portal, just to make sure it functions. But speak with this Reptite now, and they'll explain that they're getting 
a little bit worried because their neighbor has been gone for quite a while. So we're going to have to go inspect him and see if everything's all right. So our next objective is to, to accept the quest and then go all the way back to Mount Emerald and go all the way to the top. So this next part is only available if you have completed the new quest earlier. And by doing so, we now have access to speaking to the new master and he's asleep in front of this uh, bridge right here. I'm not sure how the reptile got across. Maybe he climbed over him or something like that. But anyways, because he's our friend, he's willing to move over a few steps. That is what friendship is all about, I'm telling you. So now we can continue on towards the left. This whole area leads to um, a spot that looks very similar to the dungeons in Guardia Castle, which is a little strange. I don't know why the reptites are building this, like, giant metal building here in the middle of nowhere. You'd think they could, like, improve their own living conditions first or something. Um, I realize this is just because the development team is trying to reuse assets a little bit, and that's why we have this scene, but it just feels weird because it doesn't belong at all. I realized, though, he was quite specifically asking for steel ingots, though, so, I mean, it makes sense that's the material he was using. Although he was using the godwood as well, so I don't know. Whatever, so he, the reptite was about to fall off the bridge, so we stopped him from dying. It's a good thing we came to check out him, check up on him randomly, right? So he says that he also needs somebody who is very strong who could help him build the bridge. So you want to go back to the new master and ask him if he would like to help. Yeah, that's what all that martial arts training was for, right? You know, you trained for 65 million years, and obviously the natural outcome for that is to be conscripted for manual labor. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, it doesn't feel anywhere near as epic anymore, does it? He sure is strong. Like, <laughs> So uh, we bring him back over to the reptite and they're gonna work together to build this bridge. So they become buddies and everything's great. And the new will work for a while until he runs out of energy and then he's going to need some food. So he requests that you go back to town and get him something to eat. I would say overall my sentiment about the Lost Sanctum side quest is just that I feel like they're kind of lame. Like, they're okay. I, like, I understand it's just kind of like arbitrary plot devices to get us to, like, get some free XP or whatever. So it just, and we're getting some items along the way, and that's fine. But this part, I feel like in particular, this quest is like the weakest link in the entire thing. It's like, they just make you go up and down the mountain over and over and over again. It's just so, like tacky, I guess? I don't know. I just felt like it could have been done a lot better. I've always kind of felt like quests in games where they just make you go, you know, go left, go right, go left, go right, over and over and over again just kind of, like, feels lazy to me and it just really, I find it super irritating. This whole side quest gave me flashbacks of previous games I've played that made me do that like crazy. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, <laughs> it's happening again. So go all the way back to town, speak with the bottom left reptite to then get the hearty lunch. Now this particular reptite wants to befriend the new, and we'll learn more about that later, which comes into play here in a little while. So next, finally, we're going back all the way up the mountain and bringing the hearty lunch to the new, which will then give him the energy he needs to continue working for a little while anyways, until he runs out of energy once again. However, a regular hearty lunch that was amazing, by the way, is not going to be good enough for him moving forward. So he requests that he, what he really is craving is something sweet and yellow from his past. So this is something that we cannot find in 600 AD at all, so we're gonna have to go to the past and try and figure out what that is. So while I do think that the whole going back and forth thing is really arbitrary and ridiculous, one bright spot in the midst of all that is that you can keep an eye out for the blue-gray wonder rocks while you're doing that, and as a reminder, if you see one, they quickly swap out for speed, haste, and status protection, and then use twin charm with Ayla and Marl to get a lunacite shard. So next, return to 65 million BC and speak with the cook in the bottom left corner of Lost Sanctum. I'm not sure if this step is actually required or not, but just to be on the safe side, just go ahead and speak with her. Um, and then this cook will tell you that you want to go and kill monsters in Southern Swamp to get some food on them, because all the monsters keep a different food item on them, which is the best way to get the local delicacies, which that makes total sense. You know, I, I do the same thing. I just keep some chicken cordon bleu on me at all times. So the thing is that if you kill different enemies, they'll each drop different uh, quest items, but most of them are wrong. You need to collect the correct food and then bring it back to the new in order for it to work. Remember the description is something sweet and yellow. So what we want to do is you want to kill the Death Creeper, which is in the top right corner of Southern Swamp, and then that is the monster that has the sweet bananas on it, which makes total sense. I mean, what other enemy would you expect to have bananas on them? Also, by the way, do bananas grow in swamps? I thought that they didn't. That didn't make sense. Is it tropical here? And apparently the climate changed in um, 65 million years, which I guess that's not really a surprise. So change it back to 600 AD, then go back to Mount Emerald and go all the way back to the bridge and then bring the new, the sweet banana. So again, there are, I think there's four different food items. So just the sweet banana is the only one that works. The other ones, we have the smoked meat, the songbird egg, and the, oh, what's the other one called? The Millennia Fruit, which is in Millennia Forest. Uh, so those are the other food items. I think there might be more, but I'm not actually 100% sure in all the different variety. But regardless, all the other ones are wrong. 
so the sweet banana is the one you need. This next quest requires the waystone. I actually did cover this earlier on in this whole progression of events, because I got it at a time when it was really convenient. However, it wasn't required at that exact point, so now is the point when it's actually required. So, next what you need to do is go to 65 million BC and speak with the Reptite in the bottom right corner, and then the one just north of that. So you have to speak with both of these guys, I believe. I know at least one of them is required in order to make this next step actually happen, but I'm not entirely sure which one it is or whatever. Just speak with both of them just to make sure, and in that order, just to make sure it works. Go to the top of Mount Emerald and go place the Saint Stone at the top of the mountain if you haven't done it yet. This will cause it to start being charged up here in the sun. And then you just go ahead and leave, return to 600 AD, and then go all the way back up Mount Emerald to get the Waystone. At this point, you can return to 65 million BC and then speak with the bottom right Reptite, and now we can finally accept the quest for the Dark Cave. So this Reptite is saying that because we have the Waystone, we can, it provides a bunch of light, and this is where you actually accept this particular quest. So I actually already got the Waystone earlier on in a uh, previous quest. I got them at the same time just to make it a little bit more convenient. So if you haven't done that yet, that's what the required step first in order to get this Dark Cave quest. So with the quest in hand, you can finally go to Southern Swamp and then go over to the far left where you'll enter the cave. Now we actually have gone to this cave in uh, six, in 600 AD where we got the steel ingot um, but in the past instead there's completely different items inside all the chests so you can go ahead and kill all the enemies in here if you want but open all the chests in the various locations to get a bunch of goodies you kind of have to go through the wall there's these little hidden places so you watch the video you can see where I'm walking through these little like hidden doorways in order to get to these chests once you finally make it to the end, you'll find yourself in this dark room in which our characters will use the Waystone as long as you have acquired that and gotten the Dark Cave quest, and this will allow us to move through this particular room. Ironically enough, this room actually is available in 600 AD, and we can totally see just fine. There's just some rubble blocking the stairs. Meanwhile, in 65 million BC, the stairs are clear. However, the room is dark for some reason. So now that we have the Waystone that allows us to get past that single screen, and that was the only purpose it served. Yay! <laughs> feels very arbitrary. Again, I think it's weird because we were able to see in the future and it wasn't a problem. But anyways, now once you make it through, you will then find yourself in this dungeon that looks very similar to Tyranna Lair. Now as soon as we arrive, our characters will hide because there is some monsters speaking up ahead. But after a moment, they will notice us and we will then confront them and have to defeat them. Now what they're speaking of is that they're planning to make a run on the nearby Reptite village and eat them all. So that's bad. And so we are going to try and prevent that. So after defeating the monsters here, we have to run all the way back to the village and warn them about what's about to happen. But basically the end result of this is just that we're going to have to work our way back towards the dungeon and kill all of the enemies that are on their way towards the village. We're just intercepting them before they ever get there. So in other words, we just makes us teleport back to base and then we're going to have to work our way back towards the dungeon again. So everything we just did, we need to do it again. Which just feels like super arbitrary. I wish instead we actually fought in town. Like maybe some monsters appear and the reptites like meanwhile start scurrying away like... Eh you know that would be kind of cool and you have to like run to different parts of the town to defend monsters yeah defend the reptites as monsters are showing up and keep running back and forth i think that would be more interesting but just the way it is right now it just feels really arbitrary it just changes the battle slightly that we're encountering on the way to the dungeon but it just feels like we didn't actually accomplish anything you know so i think this is one of the more frustrating uh developments in this whole lost sanctum area so anyways at this point though too the reptites will then gift us with an item to help us with our quest so this is the quest reward for discovering the dark cave which is the judgment Scythe. Now between the Doom Sickle and the Judgment Scythe, I would say that the Judgment Scythe is probably a little bit nicer overall. It's a smidge less damage, but it does inflict the stop status on enemies as well, which is pretty valuable. You're not really like meleeing with Magus most of the time anyways, and this only affects his regular attack. His spells are not affected by his weapon damage anyway, so I'd feel like I'd rather get the status effect, but whatever you want to do for that. I do find it funny that the Reptites even have this weapon in the first place. They're like, we're all weak and we can't defend ourselves. We have no technology. And then they're like, guess what? Here's a demonic scythe that's like super epic quality enchanted like legendary gear for you. <laughs> like, why, why do they even have this thing? I'm just going to fast forward through most of this. It's all pretty self-explanatory. Just use hard-hitting magic attacks to hit everything. The one thing worth noting is just the fact that the Cryosaurs, those yellow dinosaur looking things, are immune to light, so you don't want to use that on them. Now, other, any other attacks, especially if you use physical, they can counter attack with a lock status effect, which is kind of annoying. If you have status protection, you don't need to worry about it. But otherwise, you just want to hit them really hard to hopefully kill them in the first place, so you don't have to worry about it. Now, once you finally arrived at the monster lair, this area does not actually have a name. Like, none of the characters in the game actually specifically say anything about it, so I don't actually think we know what the official title is of this particular location. There is a sparkly at the beginning that you can use to save or use shelters to restore yourself if you need to, which is pretty nice. Although we have enough characters at this point, you can just kind of swap characters back and forth. For the most part, it shouldn't matter. I'm just going to fast forward through most of this, but I am kind of exploring everything just so you can see it on my map and kind of get a feel for it. Um, once you go to the far left side, though, you will find a bunch of eggs, and one of them contains the turbo shot. This is an 
upgrade for Luca that also boosts her speed. That's kind of the most notable thing about it. Like in combination with like Tabin's suit and like Tabin's helm and then the turbo shot, you can get a whole ton of speed for Luca. It is a little bit worthless at this point in the game because we're going to be able to farm for speed capsules here very shortly. So I don't think it really matters too much. Um, other than that, the turbo shot doesn't really have anything super cool about it. The wonder shot that you get from Luca's side quest is significantly better in general. The damage is a little bit more random. But, and it's not, so it's not quite as reliable in that sense, but the overall damage it does is significantly higher. And once you go up one floor, you'll eventually come to this point where there are three doors in a row. The left and right one take you up to a particular floor, floor that just kind of circles around and has additional items. Meanwhile, the middle door will take you onward in the dungeon. So I'd recommend you go to the two sides first and get the goodies. Now on the left side, this eventually leads to an egg that has the dragon armor, which is a male only chest piece that has fairly high defense, but it has a great, great deal of strength. It gives you 10 strength for a chest piece, which is actually quite a bit. Now we are getting to the point later in the game where we are starting to cap out on strengths. We can only get up to 99. So at a certain point, it's not going to be worthwhile to have this armor on at all. But until you do cap that out, this is still a great way to greatly boost your damage. I would say probably the character who's the most gets the most benefit out of this is probably going to be Frog. I'd recommend you put it on a character that you're planning on using physical text with, would be what I, my recommendation would be. Once you start capping that out, though, and you, you're maxed out on strength, you're better off uh, swapping it out probably for something else like the Moonbeam Armor that provides more total armor in general. So as a quick comment too, you know, your weapon damage will affect not just your regular damage, but it also affects your physical tech damage as well. Now in Luca's particular case, she doesn't have any physical techs and all of her, dam all of her damage for all of her techs comes from her magic stat. So as a result, she doesn't actually benefit, uh, like her techs don't benefit from her weapon damage at all. So yes, the Wonder Shot is a better weapon overall. However, if you don't have your speed maxed and you're only using her for spellcasting anyway, the Turbo Shot might make more sense until you have your speed caps because you might as well. It's a big bonus. Like just having that slot, if she's only casting spells anyway, she's not even attacking regularly, or if she is, she's just finishing enemies off real quick with just a little bit of extra damage, then it doesn't matter how much damage she does. You know what I mean? Even if it's a little bit less and the Wonder Shot has a chance to hit for harder, like who cares? So the speed might be more worthwhile. So just as a as a comment back and forth, the pros and cons of that particular item. So whatever you want to do, turbo shot or not. So once you've explored the two side areas, you can then go through the middle door to lead onwards. Now up a floor, you can go to the left to reach a dead end that contains a chest with the Stardust Bow. This is a weapon for Marl, but it's not as good as the Valkyrie Bow that we get from Frog Side Quest. So that one is significantly better. So the Stardust Bow is kind of meh. I'm going to go ahead and get it anyways. Um, now after that, if you go to the right side, this will lead onward. But along the way, you will find a chest contain or an egg rather, containing the Reptite Dress. I think this one's pretty interesting to point out because it's a female-only chest piece and it boosts someone's magic stat. Now, in general, I would say the Prismatic Dress is the best option, otherwise the Zodiac Cape is another really good option for Ayla in particular because her magic defense and magic stat are really low. Uh, but magic will boost the damage of her Inferno ability and will also increase the, greatly increase the healing of her Slurp Kiss ability. And she doesn't even need that much magic to do it, but it's just a really great way to increase that. So if you give her, like, the, the Reptite Dress and then, like, um, you know, a, a Magic Ring or something like that, you can greatly increase the amount of magic she has for a particular fight, so she can just destroy somebody with fire damage. Also, the armor on it is a little bit lower, but Ayla has some of the highest physical defense in the entire game, so like I wouldn't worry about sacrificing a little bit of that to give her another stat that she really needs. So once you finally reach the end, you'll see a sparkly, and you can save here and use shelters if you like, and then we're finally ready for the next boss. Now, as far as what you want to do for equipment and such, what I'd recommend you do is put blue plate on whoever's going to be in your first slot, because that person will all that slot will always be attacked with water damage, which is kind of weird. And then meanwhile, for the other two characters, you can absorb a lot of damage by simply wearing the black plate. So what I recommend is whoever's in your first slot wear blue plate, whoever's in your other two slots wear black plate. This is a pretty gimmicky fight because as soon as you kill one of them, then the other one will cause it to revive it and then you'll have to fight it all over again and back at full life. So you need to kind of whittle them down kind of evenly in order to make sure they both die around the same time. Otherwise, you'll end up having this fight continue perpetually forever. Unfortunately, they do have different vulnerabilities. The red one is weak to water and physical. Meanwhile, the blue one is weak to fire and magic in general. Now, unfortunately, a lot of our really good techs are all going to be magic attacks that hit the whole screen. And what that means is the blue one's going to take more damage overall, and you can try and take advantage of their particular elemental weaknesses. Like you could do, for example, a whole bunch of full screen attacks that are water in nature, so that way the red one's taking a little bit more damage from it, even though he's resistant to magic. However, that doesn't really seem to work out super well. You can use some single techs on him, but it's kind of like, it's a little bit awkward. So a couple different ways you can do this. One way that's kind of cool is just to use either shadow or light, because those are elements that they aren't particularly weak to, but you just use the, the thing that, you use whatever the hardest hitting shadow and light attacks you have. So we have like Luminaire and uh, Electrocute with Robo and Chrono. Those are actually pretty good abilities, but they take require a lot of magic on those characters before they start getting good. 
So generally speaking, probably for most of you, um, like Marl and Luca and Magus are going to be your highest damage magic damage dealers. And with them, they actually have access to shadow damage, so you can do Antipode Bomb 3 and Dark Matter are really good abilities if you have your techs maxed out at this point. And so those do really good damage. One of the unfortunate things that's going to happen with that, if you hit the whole screen with those, is the blue one is more weak to magic in general, so he'll take double the damage, meanwhile the red one takes half the damage. Now this is actually kind of funny because it works out in your favor because if you just do this and you only do this, then what'll happen is you're just murdering the blue one like crazy, and he takes double the damage and the red one takes half the damage, right? So you'll kill the blue one, he'll get revived, but now the red one meanwhile has only been taking half the damage the entire time, which that means is that when we kill the blue one the first time, the red guy is half dead. So, he revives the blue one, we just attack them all again, then we'll kill both the red one and the blue one at the same time. This is a really easy way to just kind of ignore a lot of the mechanics of this fight and just circumvent that entirely. Just a really simple, straightforward thing, just, just keep hitting them like really hard and you just win. And it's just great. So that's one way you can do that. And one of the nice things about that is because we're using these, we're using fewer harder hitting attacks, that's what, kind of what you want to do for this boss because they always, they constantly counter and absorb your MP. So if you can do fewer attacks, you have less counterattacks to worry about, so thus you're not draining too much MP. So here's another really easy strategy. If you have the Crisis Arm with Robo from Robo Side Quest, then this will greatly increase his damage as long as his last digit of his current HP ends in 9. So as long as I just keep healing him, then you can do really massive damage. Now the damage of this ability is based off of, of Robo's weapon damage, and thus his current health. Um, and also it's based off of Ayla and Robo's strength stat. So as long as their strength stat is pretty high or it's maxed out, they do really good damage. Now I can technically boost this even further by wearing the prison specs, and that would be really good as well. Um, however, I didn't actually do that for this particular recording. So just note, like the damage is really ridiculous and I don't even have everything optimized like crazy at all. So meanwhile, I'm just using Frog to heal just to make sure that Robo's health stays high. So I'm guaranteeing he's taking really good damage. And then I'm just alternating back and forth between who I'm attacking just to keep them relatively even. As far as equipment, once again, which I talked about this in the last battle, but I'll explain in a little more detail this time, the blue guy will occasionally use some water attacks. One of them hits the whole screen, another one just hits only a single target. That one always hits first slot, as far as I can tell. I recorded this many times, and every single time it was always the person in first slot. So I think, I don't know if there's, it just happened to be that way, because I got it like 30 times in a row, but um, it's possible it could be other people, but just to be on the safe side, what I did is I put the blue plate on the person in slot number one. In this case, that's Robo. Also, a quick note about that is that means that water attacks are healing him instead. Notice that I have Frog in slot number two. I quite specifically, the person I put the blue plate on is not Frog because Frog already reduces incoming water damage passively anyways. And meanwhile, Ayla reduces incoming fire damage passively. So something else you can do too, so with that being said, I have the blue plate on Fro on Robo, I have the black plate on Frog and Ayla, because that'll reduce the total damage they take by quite a bit for like half the attacks. And then another thing I could do to additionally boost it is I could, um, or reduce damage taken, is I do have like a Dark Helm, which is only wearable, wearable by dudes, put that on Robo, and then meanwhile put Mermaid Helms on Frog and Ayla, and that would reduce water damage they take. So that's something else I could do. I didn't actually do the water helms for that particular fight, but I did everything else I talked about. Anyway, the general idea of that last fight was just the fact that I just kind of evenly did damage to both of them, but I was hitting so hard that it didn't really matter. And there's like a little bit of time in between after you kill one of the bosses between that and when they get revived. So the idea was just I had to kill them really, really fast. So I guess one comment about that is you just have to make sure your characters are fast enough. I suppose in particular would be making sure that you did Robo side quest first because um, in Genodome, because that increases his speed by three. So that's a really big boost. So if you don't have that, then uh, Robo might be a little bit too slow. Slow. Now, if you found that idea a little bit intimidating because you'd rather just like whittle them down a little bit more evenly, you can also just keep track of their damage numbers. So in this example, I have a much more defensive team where I have Robo and Frog for healers. And then meanwhile, what I did is I used a full screen attack and I just want to keep track of the damage numbers. So right now, the guy, the red guy has taken about 2,000 damage, blue guy has taken about 1,000 damage. And then meanwhile, Chrono has the Wrathbound on, on so he's going to be counterattacking a lot. So that guy's taken 2,800 damage, the blue guy's taken about 1,000. So I'm just kind of keeping track of that. So because the blue guy is so far behind now, I'm going to go ahead and use triple attack so I can do a lot of damage to him and see how much it is. 2,000. All right, so 3,800 and 3,000. That's what I got right now. The Wrath Band could potentially be like a little bit too random for you, although he's counterattacking almost all the time. So basically any full screen attack that the bosses use will then cause a counter. So you're kind of just constantly doing damage to them all the time, which is great. Um, honestly, I suppose if I'm going to be doing that, it probably would have been smarter to have Chrono in the first slot because again, the blue guy's water attack that only hits one target always hits the middle per or the person in your first slot. 
So it might have been smarter for me to have Chrono in that slot with the Wrath Band to guarantee that I'm doing damage to the blue guy whenever he uses a single target attack as well. So next I was feeling pretty smart because I thought to myself, I'll just use like a full screen attack that hits really hard just so I'm not wasting as much MP from their uh, counter to steal stuff. So I'll just use a lightning attack and so we'll just do more damage to the blue guy, except it didn't. It did more damage to the red guy, which I'm not actually sure why this is. Um, he's not vulnerable to shadow and or to lightning. In fact, the blue guy should be taking more damage because of his magic attack in general. I'm not sure why that particular one worked out that way, but I'm still just keeping track of the damage numbers. But you get the idea of what I'm doing. I'm just counting in my head how much damage they've taken, and I'm just trying to focus on whoever needs more damage. So right now, I need to do more damage to the blue guy. So by counting like this, I can just kind of guarantee that I'm just keeping them relatively even, and then uh, what I can do to finish them off, once I'm counting to the point where I feel like they're both roughly at around, like, say, 7,000 HP remaining, uh, the blue one, by the way, only has 7,500. Meanwhile, the red one has 8,000. It's a little bit more. Uh, but as long as I just kind of guarantee that once they're pretty close to dead, I can just follow up with a really hard-hitting full screen attack. And this will probably do over 1,000 damage, which should finish them off. However, at this point, because I'm keeping their health relatively even, all I have to do is I have Frog ready to go so I can use Aerial Strike, which is a really hard-hitting single-target physical tech. And I can use that to finish off whoever's remaining. So instantly, as soon as that other tech goes off, and bam, I can follow up with something else to guarantee that I finish them off. Alright, so now I'm going to show one last battle. This time I'm showing like kind of a combination of all the different strategies I've talked about so far. So I'm using Luca and Marl to do anti code Bomb 3 because they, they hit really hard with magic. They're just, their magic stat is off the charts, so they're just really, really good. It's a super good dual tech. It's not the most MP efficient thing in the world. However, again, as I keep saying for this walkthrough, as long as you have enough capacity to kill the boss, then it doesn't matter. Like, you know, if you have more than enough mana to do it, then you're, you just win anyways. So the thing about this is I'm going to do double damage to the blue guy, right? And then meanwhile, the red guy is more vulnerable to physical. So by switching and having my third slot be, or my third character be a physical damage dealer, I can just single target down the red guy. And this brings his HP numbers pretty similar, so I can keep both of the bosses even. Now, one other comment is I do have um, Chrono has the Wrath Band on, but so that's countering against both the bosses. And I really like this because it's additional damage that doesn't cause their Osmos counter, so I'm not losing MP. So it's just additional damage that doesn't cost me anything. Plus, I also just think it's really smart for a battle like this where the two bosses, both of them, are using full screen attacks all the time. And so as a result, Chrono's countering just about every single time. So I'm doing good damage to both of them. You know what I mean? I have multiple targets. They're both using full screen attacks. And so he's countering on both of them. And it's great. And it doesn't cause their counter either. So it's just great. So just by alternating back and forth between magic full screen attacks and single target physical, I can guarantee that I'm killing both these guys at a pretty similar rate. Now, if you're not going to be wearing the plates, then you're better off wearing just magical defense gear. So for the girls, definitely the prismatic dress is going to be the best thing. Otherwise, like a zodiac cape. For the guys, you can wear like moonbeam armor is pretty good. Another option you can do too is I was saying like way earlier in the game that it's really good to have um, Tabin or the have Luca wear the Tabin's helm and just keep it. The physical defense on it isn't very high, the armor value is low. However, the it has 10 magic defense on it, which is very high actually. It's a really high magic defense item. Um, so if you put that on Luca, it will greatly reduce the magic damage he takes from all elements, which is great. Uh, the boss only has one physical tech, which doesn't even do that much damage, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. I think the magic damage is much more of a deal. So anyways, um, although at the same time though, if you're at this point, if you're a similar level to what I am right now, Luca's probably really close to maxing out her magic defense, so I wouldn't worry about it too much, especially for her. She's like literally like one of the least problematic like magic damage taking people in the game, so it's kind of low priority. So upon defeating the boss, we then return to Lost Sanctum and are rewarded with the Valor Crest, which is one of the best items in the entire game. Super good! This is one of the main reasons you want to do the Lost Sanctum, is to get this item right here. Now what this does is this is an Ayla exclusive accessory that will boost her crit chance by 20% and also will give her a 50% counter chance. This item at the end of the game is like the best. This is amazing. For now though, it's just kind of okay, and I'll talk more about that here in a little bit. But basically for now, for like most of the game, I would say that you're better off with like a gold gold stud or like strength items like a strength ring until you're capped on strength anyways then you're better off with like the prism spectacles or uh, another also the wrath band is actually surprisingly really good on her especially on like the ds version because she has a very high crit chance so if she's counterattacking 80 percent of the time just like i was showing with that last boss we have a lot of like counterattacks. it's like really good so with ala if she's countering all the time she's critting all the time kind of like imagine frog's counterattack, but he's also critting with the Masamoon, you know what I mean? It's like the same kind of deal, like where Ayla can crit a bunch. So it's a similar deal where the Wrath Band is pretty good on her for now. Eventually that other item will become way better though. 
So I'll continue talking about that in a moment. Now, once you've completed all of the previous quests, you did all the bridge stuff, you did the waystone, you did the dark cave, you defended the village and destroyed the castle, whatever. Once you've done all those things, you want to return to 600 AD, climb all the way back up Mount Emerald and go to the bridge and you'll see that they finally completed it. Now at this point, they will then take us all the way back to town and they'll talk with us for a little bit and we'll receive our reward. There's a couple interactions between various reptites in particular worth noting is that there is the, the neighbor is now happy that the bridge builder person is back and the bridge builder himself is helpful to us and he gives us the Saurian leathers as reward. The new is now going to stay in the town because now he's no longer building anything and he doesn't need to stay on, on the mountain anymore. So instead he's made friends with everybody in town. In particular, the one uh, reptite that was cooking food for him earlier in the game because he apparently wanted to make a friend. So this, uh, but yeah, so now that reptite finally has a friend, which is what he wanted all along. So now the new is going to live here from now on and he has a shop where you can purchase various items. Now these items will scale depending on how many more steps of the quest you've completed. I would just ignore it for now. We're, we're literally almost at the very end of all the Lost Sanctum stuff and once you've finished all the remaining steps you'll finally be able to purchase elixirs and mega elixirs from the new. So going back to talking about Ayla, the reason that item is so good is because uh, eventually she gets really high crit chance anyway so having counter on her is pretty smart in general so like the Wrath Band's really good on her but at level 96 and onward she gets the Bronze Fist which actually has a less crit chance but when she does crit she guarantees always hits for 9999. So having 20% more crit chance is really really good on her it's amazing but also note that she can crit on her counters so she counters 50% of the time and then she crits on those too she's just destroying everything she one shot stuff all day long it's great. So Saurian Leather is a really good item that we got as a reward for one of these quests um, so it increases your defense and it also gives you plus three to strength and speed. Very good item. I would say probably the most likely person that's going to benefit the most from all these stats for now anyways until you get capped is going to be Frog. So apparently a Reptite then comes in at this point and explains that it went across the bridge and was exploring the mountains over there where it found a giant tower that it thought was really creepy and ominous. So it came running all the way back to town to let us everybody know. Like, it just seems like an overreaction, but it thinks that there's something in there that's creepy. So it requests that we go up to the tower and inspect it so we can figure out what's going on. And uh, yes, they're making us go up the mountain again. Don't worry, this is the last time though. I do swear, guys, that our characters must have like calves of steel at this point. <laughs> like so strong. So when you're finally done with all that conversation, you want to go back up Mount Emerald and go across the bridge, and at long last, we can finally fight our way over to the tower, which is the final area of Lost Sanctum. So there's a bunch of new enemies here. We have a bunch of exiles. We've seen some of them before, but not very many. There's a whole bunch in this tower, and I'm assuming these are just like a bunch of the reptiles that have been kicked out of the village over the years. All their troublemakers, I suppose. Um, now, as far as enemies here, there is a couple new enemies. We have a bunch of death guards, which are pretty simple. They have a lot of health, and they do actually hit pretty hard. They are more weak to magic than other things, so just using a really hard, like, magic magic uh, single tech or something would be really nice, so like uh, fire tackle is what I'm using for this video for example, or fire punch. And then otherwise we also have bone knights. Now those guys are also weak to magic, but they will absorb shadow. So I've been using magus this whole time and using like dark matter, however that's not really going to work for a lot of these enemies here because we have like, um, we have different points where we'll have like two or three skeletons at one time and uh, Shadow doesn't work on them. I can use like Fire too, but it's just not very good. So that being said, uh, I'm gonna be using Luca with like the Gold Stud and have her use Flare a bunch. And then otherwise you could also use like Chrono with Luminaire if you gave him some magic, although that doesn't quite as likely to be effective. You can also use like Water 2 and Ice 2 with Marl and Frog, but it's not very good. Of course, you could always just go the opposite extreme and then do a whole bunch of physical, like you could use um, Ayla with Chrono to do Falcon Strike and then have Robo meanwhile follow up with like a single um, Rapid Fire Fist slash Uzi Punch against a guys using the Crisis Arm would work really good. Um, so that's another potential option just to finish off single guys. Otherwise, the tower is really straightforward. You just keep going straight up. The level design is really boring. It's not very inspired at all. Um, and there's some chests along the way, but they're all really obvious. Um, in particular, worth noting is the fact that you can get a Rusted Blade, which is can lead to one of the better weapons for Chrono, although even uh, a lot of the other side quests we've done so far, Marl's side quest in particular leads to the Rainbow, which is a significantly better uh, sword than the Rusted Blade leads to. 
One other item we get here is the Dino Blade. This is a weapon for Frog that gives him plus to strength. Now, a lot of characters, if you give them more of their primary stat, it will make some of their attacks better. In Frog's case, actually, that's not true because he's so weapon dependent. In fact, um, a lot of the attacks can be based, the formula has either their primary stat or it has their attack stat for the guys. And the attack stat is like a combination between strength and your weapon damage. Now, in Frog's case, all of his offensive techs are either magic dependent or they're dependent on his weapon. They're very highly reliant on his weapon, more so than any other character, actually. So, what you want to use the weapon that does the most physical damage. So, in this case, that's the Masamun. So, if you've already completed Frog's side quest, then the Masamun is way better than the Dino Blade by far. So, even though the Dino Blade gives him plus to strength, it's not worth it because the Masamun is still just a better weapon. So, once you finally reach the top of the tower, you'll find a sparkly where we can save and use shelters, and then it's time to decide what we're going to do for our team. So the first thing to know is that there are two different counters that this boss has. If you use physical attacks on him, he'll respond with a physical counter. If you use magical attacks on him, he'll respond with a lightning counter every time. So his element will always be lightning if you are using magic on him every single time. So first of all, I'm going to show the physical strategy. If you're going to do this, I'd highly recommend you put on guardian slash safe helms because that will reduce incoming physical damage by one third. Super useful on all your characters. Now as far as remaining stuff, just wear the highest armor thing you have because that will reduce incoming physical damage as much as you can. And then as far as other weapons and stuff like that, characters I'd recommend would be like Chrono, Frog, Robo, and Ayla, just any of those four if you're going to do the physical route. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on Robo's Crisis Arm because it's just so strong. So I'm going to be using his and Ayla's uh, dual tech Beast Toss, which is super strong. It really destroys enemies, in particular with the Crisis Arm. In order for that to function, I need to keep Robo at 999 health. So I'm going to be using Frog just to keep everybody's HP up. And then this boss also does not have any status effects, so we don't have to worry about that either. So I keep wearing like Vigilant Helms or like Shala's Amulet and stuff like that, but I don't have to do that for this fight at all. So one of the first things to realize about this boss is that his minion will absorb dark, so if you use any shadow attacks on him, it'll actually heal the little guy instead. Um, however, if once the battle progresses a little bit, then the little guy will start ending up using a bunch of heals that heals both of them for 1,000 HP, and he'll just use it like bam, 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 and it just keeps the boss alive. It makes it really hard to kill him. You can focus the boss down, but it's way easier to just kill the little guy first. So I highly recommend you do that. He doesn't have very much HP anyways. Now, if you're using Beast Toss, you probably will take him out really fast. His physical resist is not very high, so you can probably take him out in just one shot, which is great. So next, we're going on to the boss himself, and Beast Toss is definitely the biggest thing you want to use here, ideally. If you have the Crisis Arm in particular, it makes it super, super nice. Just make sure you keep Robo's HP at max, because that way you can guarantee that he is doing the most damage possible. Now, in my particular case, I did put the Prison Spectacles on Robo to increase his damage by 50%, so he is doing more damage than usual, but it's just kind of ramps it up and takes it over the edge. I also put the sunglasses on Ayla to increase her damage by 20%, and I do technically have two pris prism spectacles because I got one in the Arena of Ages as well, so I could technically have one on both characters. I'm just trying to showing like what a typical like uh, you know playthrough what you should expect to be able to do with the items that you have available to you right now. Now the boss himself will also use some magic attacks to hit the whole party, and that can hurt pretty bad, although he only doesn't do it very often, as long as you have enough healing to cover it. In my case, I'm just using Star Heal by itself, which is kind of a low-end full party heal anyways, and it's more than enough to do it in my particular case. My character's maybe a little bit higher level than you are, though. Um, one weird comment about this, the Lost Sanctum is like available just after the Blackbird, so we actually have it available pretty early. I did it after all of the other character-specific side quests, which I think is overall smarter in general. But anyways, point being, if I was like 10 levels lower, this guy would be quite a bit harder. He would hit a lot harder at that point. Now, if you're going to go the magic route, what happens is when you use magic damage against this boss, he will counterattack with a lightning attack that hits everybody on the screen. Now, you can use this to your advantage by putting on white plate because then it will heal your party instead. Now, in general in the game, you can get two white plates, one from getting the uh, mysterious chest and one from charming Yakra 13 in Marl side quest. And then you can also get a white vest by opening up the chest again, or the mysterious chest again in the past. So you should have those at least in the base game pretty easily. Um, I do actually have multiple white plates because I won some in the Reign of Ages, so I have more than that. Now as far as which magic to use, the Master at Arms is immune to light, and then meanwhile the Bladesman will absorb dark. So basically you want to use one of the other two elements. Now between those, uh, water doesn't do very much. Meanwhile, fire is just a better course of action in this case. We have much higher tier techs for Luca for fire, which is really great, so she does a lot of damage. And also, uh, Magus is pretty good because he only has access to, you know, water or ice two and fire two. However, the multiplier on his versions of those abilities, as opposed to um, like Marl or Frog, is just better. He has a higher magic stat, but also the higher multiplier on those skills themselves. So he'll actually do more damage. So he's a great choice for a third slot. 
I mean, it's like we have either Robo or Chrono as well, but Chrono, again, the boss is immune to light, and then Robo can use Shadow, which the little guy will absorb too, so it's just bad. Um, also, like, um, the same thing, like, for Robo has Electrocute slash Shock uh, as his high tier spell, but that's also light, so we can't use that either. Now, I could bring Marl, and once I kill the little guy, then I can focus on using, like, Antipode Bomb 3, so that would be another option too, just after the little guy is defeated, but I think it makes more sense just to use characters where you can hit everything at the same time with everybody, and you know, just kill the little guy too. So, what I'm doing is I'm using Inferno with Luca and Ayla, and I put the Prism Spectacles on Ayla because a majority of this damage comes from her, and then I put the Sunglasses on Luca just to boost her damage just a little bit further for that particular tech. So the damage on it is just decent, it's not amazing, but it is pretty good. Um, something that's fun about this is because the boss will keep using a light counter attack, and he's just going to keep healing me over and over again, and so as a result, I don't have to worry about dying at all. I don't need to bring a healer or anything, I can just keep attacking the entire time and it's fine. Now, if you don't have this many white plates, then what I'd recommend you do is just, like, wear a whole bunch of high magic resists. So you can wear, like, the Please Bustier, for example, to increase your magic defense by quite a bit. And that would be really nice. Um, I think Luca would be the easiest person to do that with because her magic defense is so high. And uh, another thing you can do, too, as well, is you can always just put on, like, uh, I was recommending earlier in the walkthrough that you get a bunch of barrier spheres. And also, Magus, by the way, also has a spell called Barrier. And what that does is it applies the um, barrier buff on all of your characters, which reduces incoming magic damage by one third. So if you use either, you know, your Prismatic Dress does that too automatically, so you can use Prismatic Dress, you can use the Barrier Spears, or you can use Magus' Barrier Ability, and that will reduce incoming magic damage by one third, which is great. So if you don't have the option of wearing the White Plate, or you can only have it on one character or something like that, then you can kind of mix and match with other items too, to guarantee that some of your characters just aren't taking much damage in general. We actually have a lot of options here at the end of the game to deal with various situations, so it's not really that big a deal. Now you'll notice too on screen that the little guy is dead now, so I'm actually using Dark Matter on the boss now just to do a little bit more damage because I don't have to worry about the little guy getting healed by that. So once you have defeated the boss, then our characters will remark on how the remains here are no longer possessed by a spirit and then that ghost will no longer haunt this place. So then we'll go into the next room where you will see some statues of the legendary heavenly idols that the Elder spoke of back in the Reptite Village. And you'll see that apparently these idols are none other than ourselves because apparently they put up statues of us um, after we defeated the Archeo Devils in uh, the castle back in 65 million BC. So the team composition that you used back then will be will determine who the statues are at this exact time. I do find this a little strange because it implies that apparently the Reptites built this giant castle and that was it took place sometime after 65 million BC, so they apparently had a bridge in the past as well and then that apparently got like knocked down probably during 12,000 BC because that was during that whole Ice Age time and apparently the Reptites were just stuck in this cave that entire time so they lost the ability to do that, which makes sense. I mean, thousands if not millions of years stuck in a cave and they forgot all about what happened with their castle up there, or their tower, you know? But it's just strange, like, I don't know, we have all these castles, like we have the, you know, we have this castle where the monsters were over to the left, and then we also have this tower over to the right, and they're still living in these caves. I don't know, but then again, I mean, this is where all the food is, I suppose, so I don't know. I don't know which one's better. I suppose in particular during the Ice Age that it makes sense for them to go return to the caves, and then they lost all the memory of that because, um, you know, the caves probably have a little more geothermal heat anyways. They're probably warmer, so it made more sense that they would be able to survive here. Now, for completing all this, we are finally rewarded with the final prize, which is the Champion's Badge. Now, this is the same thing as the Hero's Badge and the Silver Stud mixed together, so we have the increased crit chance for the Masa Moon, as well as reduced MP usage, which is great. This is definitely best in slot for Frog, and uh, unless there's, like, something very specific you're trying to do, this is just a really good item for him. Alright, so that basically concludes all of the Lost Sanctum stuff at long last. So now we finally have access to the new that has the shop with the mega elixirs, and we've gotten a whole bunch of just rewards for our quests along the way. Um, now, the final thing that is remaining that I haven't covered in this video, I'm just going to talk about it real quick. I actually end up doing this in the next video, which is Dimensional Vortex. Uh, but the last item you can get in Lost Sanctum after you've unlocked all this stuff is that there is a reptite in the top left corner of the area that is looking for a Lumicite shard. And if you bring a Lumicite shard, it will then give you, it will then craft for you the Elemental Aegis, which is one of the best chess pieces in the game for Luka. So, um, how you get a Lumicite Shard is there are these enemies called Wonder Rocks. They look kind of like uh, silver versions of rubble that we've seen before. And they have a couple nasty abilities, but a particular thing to know about them is that they can apply lock status to you, which makes you unable to use abilities, and they also can run away. So those are the two like most important things to know about them. What you want to do is have Ayla and Maro in your party, and then charm them as soon as possible. This is the most guaranteed way to guarantee that you can get a Lumicite Shard, otherwise just hitting them really, really hard and killing them as soon as possible, because when you defeat it, they will also give you the Lumicite Shard. So either kill them or charm it to get it a little bit early. 
uh, but I'd recommend you charm. So that's how you get a Lumisite Shard, and if you bring that to the Reptite in Lost Sanctum, they will craft for you the Elemental Aegis. Now, what this chest piece does is it has pretty decent physical armor, but otherwise the special effect on it is that it will completely block all elemental damage. So elemental damage does zero damage to you is what it does for all elements, which is really overpowered. However, it does only apply in certain situations. So the thing that we know about that is that just because an attack is magic, for example, doesn't mean it's elemental. And so you can have uh, regular attacks that are non-elemental that are physical or magical. And that means that uh, they will still do damage to you. It still cuts through. This armor only blocks elemental. So that all being said, it's like really overpowered in some situations and other situations, it's completely the wrong choice because it doesn't actually block anything because you're dealing with magical as opposed to elemental. So anyways, uh, one of the best items in the game, and that is the final thing you can get here in the Lost Sanctum. Now you find Wonder Rocks, uh, they can randomly be found throughout the Lost Sanctum, but they appear much more often in Dimensional Vortex. So if you're hunting for a Lumisite Shard, I recommend you just uh, watch my next video, Dimensional Vortex, and I will show you where I actually get that particular Lumisite Shard. <sighs> okay, I'm done with all the Lost Sanctum stuff. Oh man, I spent like three weeks plus on this one video. Like man, so much work, so many hours, like recording and editing and all this commentary, voiceover work and stuff. Like geez, I'm so done with it. <laughs> but yeah, I hope you guys found this helpful. If you enjoyed this, then be sure to throw a like on it, subscribe, and stay tuned for more content just like this. As always, stay awesome, you have an amazing day, and I'll see you in the next video where I will tackle Dimensional Vortex, which is the final area of the game.